This episode we're exploring three of the most intriguing and in many ways unbelievable cases of extraterrestrial contact ever reported, each one raising questions about humanity's place in the cosmos and the possibility that we are not alone. So buckle up and let's dive into these extraordinary encounters with beings from beyond our world. The Valiant Thor case, also known as the Stranger at the Pentagon, is one of the most peculiar and controversial UFO stories, blending elements of extraterrestrial life government secrecy and alleged contact between high-ranking US officials and a humanoid alien. In March 1957, an extraterrestrial being known as Valiant Thor supposedly landed near Alexandria, Virginia, and was subsequently taken to the Pentagon, where he allegedly spent three years working with the US government. His purpose, according to proponents of the case, was to help prevent humanity from destroying itself through nuclear warfare offering advanced extraterrestrial knowledge and peaceful guidance. According to the narrative, shortly after Valiant Thor's landing, he was escorted by police officers to the Pentagon, where he was introduced to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, Vice President Richard Nixon, and other high-ranking US officials. Thor was said to have been in possession of a universal knowledge, and he offered assistance in improving the Earth's scientific and spiritual progress. Valiant Thor's mission was to convince world leaders to abandon nuclear weapons, as these weapons were seen as a significant threat, not just to Earth, but to the cosmos. Thor claimed that his home planet, Venus, had been monitoring Earth and its activities for centuries. He warned that humanity's increasing reliance on nuclear power could lead to devastating consequences not only for the planet, but for other species in the galaxy. In his book Stranger at the Pentagon, 1967, Dr. Frank E. Stranges, a UFO researcher and the main source of the story, provided details about Thor's appearance and characteristics. Valiant Thor reportedly looked like a human but had some distinct differences. He stood approximately six feet tall, had brown, wavy hair and slightly tanned skin. He was said to have six fingers on each hand, and his internal organs were allegedly different from those of a human being. According to the story, his IQ was around 1200, far beyond human capacity and he had telepathic abilities. Thor was described as an immortal being, possibly living for centuries or even longer. He spoke multiple Earth languages fluently and could communicate telepathically. Thor claimed that Venus was a thriving planet, but its inhabitants lived in underground cities to avoid the harsh surface conditions. This claim contradicts what modern science has shown about Venus, as the planet's surface is extremely inhospitable due to high temperatures and crushing atmospheric pressure. Thor's mission, as told by Dr. Stranges, was to promote peace and spiritual awakening among humanity. He offered advanced technology that could help resolve many of Earth's problems, including energy shortages, food scarcity, and diseases. However, the US government allegedly rejected his offer, fearing that it would destabilize the global economy, undermine existing power structures, and reveal too much about extraterrestrial involvement with Earth. Despite this rejection, Valiant Thor was said to have remained in contact with the US government for several years. During his stay at the Pentagon, he supposedly worked with various officials, including US Secretary of Defense Charles Irwin Wilson, and had a small group of other extraterrestrial beings with him who assisted in his mission. The primary source for the Valiant Thor story comes from Dr. Frank E. Stranges, an evangelical minister, UFO researcher, and author. Stranges claimed that he met Valiant Thor personally during a meeting at the Pentagon, According to Strangers, Thor revealed himself as an extraterrestrial and shared insights about his mission on Earth. Strangers wrote the book Stranger at the Pentagon, which detailed the entire encounter, including conversations he claimed to have had with Thor, descriptions of the alien spacecraft, and the involvement of US government officials. 
Strangers continued to share this story throughout his life, giving lectures and interviews about his experiences. After allegedly staying for three years at the Pentagon, Valiant Thor is said to have left Earth in March 1960. According to Strangers, Thor returned to his spacecraft, the Victor One, and left the planet. Before departing, however, he allegedly promised to continue monitoring Earth and assisting in its development from afar. Strangers claimed that Thor and his crew remain in contact with Earth, assisting certain individuals with technological and spiritual matters. The claim that an alien spent time at the Pentagon and interacted with high-ranking government officials like Eisenhower and Nixon makes the Valiant Thor case particularly sensational. While many UFO cases involve fleeting sightings or isolated encounters, this one suggests sustained cooperation with the US government. Unlike many UFO cases that describe extraterrestrials as greys or other strange non-human entities, Valiant Thor was depicted as being very human-like, which makes the story more unusual. The idea that Thor came from Venus is also odd, considering what modern science knows about the planet's harsh conditions. The claim of Venus being inhabited by an advanced civilization living underground remains one of the most scientifically implausible aspects of the case. Valiant Thor wasn't just offering technology or warning about nuclear weapons, he also had a spiritual agenda. He allegedly advocated for human beings to embrace peace, love, and a higher level of consciousness, which aligned with the New Age beliefs that were popular at the time. The Valiant Thor case has been met with a lot of skepticism from both the UFO community and mainstream researchers. Critics point out the lack of physical evidence supporting Strangers' claims. Additionally, the idea that a humanoid alien from Venus lived at the Pentagon for several years without any concrete proof is seen as highly unlikely. Modern studies of Venus indicate that its surface conditions, with temperatures averaging 900 degrees Fahrenheit and pressure 90 times that of Earth, would be inhospitable to life as we know it. This has led many to dismiss the story outright. There are no official records, photographs or documents to support the existence of Valiant Thor or his time at the Pentagon, making the case purely anecdotal. The fact that the entire story hinges on the testimony of Dr. Frank Stranges, who was a self-published author and UFO enthusiast, further weakens its credibility. Despite the lack of evidence and widespread skepticism, the Valiant Thor case has become a notable part of UFO mythology. It is frequently discussed in UFO circles and has been referenced in books, documentaries and conspiracy theories. The story continues to fascinate those who believe in extraterrestrial contact with Earth, especially given the idea that an alien could walk among humans unnoticed. The Valiant Thor case remains one of the most intriguing and fantastical stories in UFO lore. Its blending of government secrecy, extraterrestrial intervention and spiritual enlightenment makes it a unique and enduring tale. However, its lack of verifiable evidence and the reliance on a single source, Dr. Frank E. Stranges, places it firmly in the realm of speculative fiction for many. Still, the case continues to captivate because it taps into deep human desires for connection with the unknown, offering hope for guidance from higher intelligences and the possibility of a peaceful future shaped by extraterrestrial wisdom. Whether seen as a cautionary tale, a spiritual metaphor, or a glimpse into a hidden reality, the Valiant Thor story remains a compelling chapter in the broader discussion of UFO phenomena and the mysteries that lie beyond Earth. The Yumo case is one of the most peculiar and controversial stories in UFO and extraterrestrial lore. Emerging in the 1960s, it centers around a series of letters allegedly sent by extraterrestrials from the planet Yumo to various individuals across Europe, mainly in Spain and France. These letters contain detailed information about the aliens' advanced technology, their civilization, and their observations of Earth. The case became a prominent part of UFO culture due to its scientific content, the mysterious origins of the letters, and the long-standing intrigue surrounding them. The UMO case began in Spain in 1966 when a group of Spanish scientists, intellectuals, and UFO enthusiasts started receiving letters from beings claiming to be extraterrestrials from the planet UMO. The first known letter was sent to Fernando Sesma, a Spanish UFO enthusiast who ran a group in Madrid called the Society of Friends of the Visitors from Space. Soon, more letters followed, written in a technical and scientific style, and were received by several other people, including scientists, engineers, and ordinary citizens. The letters were often highly detailed and included complex discussions on physics, cosmology, 
and the social structure of Umo society. The letters were signed with a peculiar symbol, three vertical lines connected by a horizontal line resembling the Umo symbol, which became associated with the case. The letters, written in Spanish and occasionally French, claimed that the senders were from the planet Umo, located about 14.6 light-years from Earth in the constellation Wolf 424. The extraterrestrials claimed to have arrived on Earth in 1950 after detecting radio signals from Earth during the 1930s, particularly Nazi Germany's transmissions of Adolf Hitler's speeches during the Olympics. The letters described the Umo civilization as being far more advanced than humanity in both technological and spiritual terms. They explained that Umo was a planet similar to Earth in size and conditions, and that the Umo civilization had developed advanced space travel, communication and scientific understanding far beyond Earth's capabilities. The letters claimed that the Umite visitors were conducting a long-term study of Earth and its inhabitants, sending small teams to observe human behavior and report back to their planet. The letters contained what appeared to be advanced scientific theories, especially in physics. These theories often blended recognizable scientific concepts with highly speculative ideas. For example, the Umites described a technology for faster-than-light space travel and communication across vast distances via hyperspace. Some concepts were familiar, while others seemed entirely novel and untestable. The Umites shared complex diagrams and explanations related to quantum mechanics, parallel universes, and the structure of matter. They described an advanced understanding of atomic energy and proposed new ways to interpret quantum mechanics that contradicted or expanded upon Earth's scientific theories at the time. However, much of this information was difficult to verify or understand, leading to skepticism about its legitimacy. The letters provided detailed descriptions of the alien social, political and cultural organization. According to the letters, Umo society was governed by a meritocratic system where individuals were assigned roles based on their capabilities and skills. The planet had no centralized government or religious institutions as their civilization had advanced beyond the need for such structures. Their society valued logic, rationality and spiritual evolution, emphasizing the development of individual and collective consciousness. The letters also claimed that teams were observing Earth to understand humanity's development and evaluate its potential for space-faring civilizations. They expressed concern over Earth's nuclear proliferation and the social instability that came with it. Like many other UFO contact stories, the Yumo case involved warnings about humanity's dangerous trajectory, particularly regarding nuclear war and environmental destruction. The Umites stated that they maintained a policy of non-interference with Earth's affairs, similar to the Prime Directive in the Star Trek universe. They preferred to observe from a distance though they claimed to have made limited contact with certain individuals on Earth, mostly scientists and intellectuals, whom they deemed capable of understanding their messages. The letters did not describe any mass UFO sightings or public appearances, focusing instead on the dissemination of knowledge through written communication. While the case primarily revolved around letters, there were a few alleged UFO sightings connected to the story. One of the most famous incidents occurred in 1967 in San Jose de Valdera, Spain, when witnesses reported seeing a strange craft in the sky marked with the UMO symbol. Photographs were taken of the object, and it became one of the few physical pieces of evidence linked to the case. However, these photographs were later called into question, with some researchers suggesting they might have been part of an elaborate hoax. In 1993, José Luis Jordan Peña, a prominent Spanish UFO investigator, claimed that he had fabricated the UMO story. According to Peña, he started sending the letters as an experiment in social psychology to observe how people would react to the idea of extraterrestrial contact. He allegedly created the UMO symbol and orchestrated the San Jose de Valderas UFO sighting by constructing a fake UFO model and photographing it. Some researchers and believers in the case dispute Peña's confession, arguing that the UMO letters contained too much complex scientific knowledge for a single person to fabricate. While the letters contained many technical details, much of the science they discussed was difficult to verify or inconsistent with established scientific knowledge. Some of the theories in the letters appeared to be based on speculative ideas or pseudoscience. Critics have argued that the technical content of the letters is not convincing enough to support the idea of extraterrestrial origin. The letters were sent to many different people across Europe over several decades, 
leading to speculation that the case may have been an elaborate social experiment or prank. The recipients of the letters were often individuals involved in UFO research, which raised suspicions about why the Umites would choose to contact UFO enthusiasts instead of a broader audience. The content of the letters reflects many of the concerns and themes present in 1960s UFO culture, especially post-World War II anxieties about nuclear weapons and the Cold War. The letters also fit into the broader pattern of UFO contact cases that emphasized advanced extraterrestrial civilizations offering guidance to humanity, a theme seen in cases like George Adamski and the Ashtar Command. Despite the controversies, the case had a significant influence on the UFO community, especially in Europe. The scientific tone of the letters and their focus on advanced technology and space exploration distinguished the case from other UFO contact stories, which were often more fantastical or spiritual in nature. Several books and articles were written about the case, and the letters became a subject of interest for both UFO researchers and sociologists studying belief systems. Even though the case is widely believed to have been a hoax, it remains a notable example of how UFO mythology can blend science, fiction and social commentary into the wider picture. The case is one of the most complex and debated UFO stories due to its mix of scientific content, intricate communication and its lasting influence on European UFO culture. Whether it was an elaborate hoax or an actual attempt by extraterrestrial beings to communicate with Earth, it continues to intrigue those fascinated by the possibilities of alien life and interstellar contact and our place within it, while also serving as a cautionary tale about how easily belief and mystery can be intertwined. The Friendship Case, also known as Amicizia in Italian, is one of the most mysterious and long-lasting UFO-related cases in Italy, spanning from the 1950s to the 1970s. It involves alleged contact between a group of human-like extraterrestrials and a group of humans, predominantly in Italy, but with contacts also reported in other countries such as Germany and Switzerland. The case involves claims of communication with these extraterrestrials, known as the W-56, who reportedly lived in underground bases on Earth and had advanced technology and spiritual wisdom. The case is particularly notable because it involved dozens of witnesses, many of whom claim to have had direct interaction with the extraterrestrials. Some of these individuals were highly respected members of society, including scientists, doctors and military personnel. Like many UFO cases, it also raises questions about its authenticity due to the lack of hard evidence and the fantastic nature of the claims. It began in 1956 when a group of individuals in Pescara, a coastal city in Italy, reportedly made contact with extraterrestrial beings from a distant star system. The key figure who first encountered these beings was Bruno Samaciccia, a well-known Italian psychologist and philosopher who later became one of the main voices in recounting the events of the Friendship Case. Samaciccia described the extraterrestrials as members of a group called the W-56. The name W-56 is said to come from a code used to identify their species. The extraterrestrials referred to themselves as the Friendship Group, Due to their friendly intentions and desire to establish a positive relationship with humans, the name Amicizia, friendship, stuck as the central theme of this supposed interaction was peace, cooperation and mutual understanding. The W-56 were said to be very tall, some reportedly over 10 feet tall, though some members of the group were smaller and closer to human size. Despite their size, they appeared very similar to humans in terms of their facial features and body structure. Their appearance was sometimes described as Nordic due to their blonde hair and blue eyes. They had highly advanced technology far beyond human capabilities, allegedly possessed the ability to teleport, manipulate matter and travel through space using anti-gravity technology. They were also said to have control over time and space, which allowed them to move quickly across vast distances in the universe. According to the testimonies of those involved in the Friendship case, the W-56 had several underground bases on Earth, including one in Italy near Pescara, as well as bases in Germany, South America, and other locations around the world. These bases were enormous and equipped with advanced technology, yet they were hidden from human detection. The visitors emphasized spirituality, love, and cooperation over materialism. They often expressed concern for humanity's destructive tendencies, especially the potential for nuclear war and environmental degradation. Their goal was to assist humanity in evolving spiritually and technologically, but without direct interference. They valued positive emotions such as love, 
compassion, and solidarity, and they stress the importance of these virtues in human development. A central figure in the friendship case was Bruno Samatitia, who claimed that the W56 initiated contact with him in 1956 and introduced him to other members of their group. Through Samatitia, the group began communicating with a wider circle of humans, and over the years, dozens of people reportedly became involved in this contact. These individuals were often respected professionals, including doctors, scientists, military personnel, and engineers. According to the testimonies, the W56 established a form of ongoing cooperation with their human counterparts. They shared knowledge about science, philosophy, and spirituality, and they sometimes requested assistance from humans for materials or supplies to help maintain their underground bases. The humans who were in contact formed a secretive community known simply as the group, or the friendship group. Members of this group claimed to have met with the extraterrestrials in person, seen their technology, and even visited their underground bases. The W56 did not reveal themselves to the public, so the group acted as intermediaries between the W56 and the wider world. According to some accounts, this group worked closely with the W56 to support their mission on Earth, providing resources such as food, electronics and other materials that the extraterrestrials requested. The friendship group was said to be a closely knit community, bonded by their shared experiences and their belief in the aliens' peaceful mission. This group operated in secret, but over the years, more people were brought into the fold, including high-profile figures who claimed to have witnessed the extraterrestrials' presence and technology firsthand. Over the course of the 1950s to the 1970s, there were numerous reports of UFO sightings in Italy that were linked to the Friendship case. Many of these sightings involved disc-shaped craft or large cigar-shaped objects. These sightings were often witnessed by members of the Friendship Group and occasionally by others in the surrounding areas. One famous incident occurred in 1978 when several members of the group reported seeing a large cigar-shaped UFO hovering above the sea near Pescara. According to witnesses, the object was several hundred meters long and remained stationary in the sky for a prolonged period before disappearing. Photographs and videos of these sightings were taken, though their authenticity has been widely debated. An interesting aspect of the Friendship case is the alleged existence of a rival extraterrestrial group known as the CTR, who were described as malevolent beings. The CTR were said to be the ideological and spiritual opposites of the W56. While the W56 advocated for peace, cooperation and love, the CTR were described as materialistic and selfish, working to manipulate humanity for their own ends. The W56 warned their human contacts about the dangers posed by the CTR, claiming that these beings had infiltrated certain aspects of human society, particularly through secretive political and economic organizations. The conflict between the W56 and the CTR was described as a cosmic struggle between good and evil, with humanity caught in the middle. By the late 1970s, contact between the Friendship Group and the W56 reportedly began to fade. Various reasons were given for the cessation of communication. Some members claimed that internal disagreements and distrust within the human group caused the breakdown of the relationship. Others suggested that the CTR had become too powerful and had forced the W56 to retreat from Earth. The last reported communications from the W56 occurred in the early 1980s, after which contact was said to have stopped altogether. Despite this, the case continued to be discussed and researched by UFO enthusiasts and researchers in Italy and abroad, with many still believing that the W56 had, at one time, been actively involved in helping humanity. The Friendship case remains one of the most perplexing UFO cases in modern history, particularly because of the scope of the claims and the number of witnesses involved. Whether it was a genuine contact experience or an elaborate social phenomenon, the case has left a lasting legacy in Italian UFO culture and beyond. As we wrap up this episode into the world of alien contact on Earth, we find ourselves at the crossroads of belief and skepticism. The idea that intelligent life from distant worlds may have been visiting our planet for centuries is both awe-inspiring and a little unsettling. While some dismiss these accounts as hoaxes, hallucinations or the misinterpretation of natural phenomena, the sheer volume of reports, coupled with the shared themes across cultures and time periods, suggests that there may be more to the story. Are these visitors offering us a glimpse into a wider universe, a universe filled with mysteries yet to be unlocked, 
Or are these tales the result of our own deep longing for connection with something greater than ourselves? Ultimately, the truth may lie somewhere in between, a blend of real phenomena, human curiosity, and the desire to explore what lies beyond the stars. Whether you're a firm believer in alien contact or a staunch skeptic, one thing is undeniable. The question of whether we are alone in the universe is one that will continue to drive our curiosity, our fears, and our hopes for generations to come. If this episode has sparked your imagination or raised new questions, I encourage you to keep exploring, keep questioning, and most of all, keep an open mind. Who knows what revelations the future may hold? Until next time, keep your eyes on the sky. Thank you.